Thanks, Dan. So, uh, Mark, uh, alphabetically, would you like to introduce yourself first? Um, my name is Mark Herbst, alphabetically. <laughs> um, I'm sitting here in Leipzig, and um, I'm, uh, yeah, Michelle, why don't you take it away, though? Okay, so my name is Michelle, and and my name is Michelle Turan, and I'm uh, sitting in, in Rotterdam, and um, I am uh, an educator, and I'm an artist, and I'm an activist, and I'm, an, uh, I'm a gardener, um, and I um, met Mark um, through a mutual friend of ours when we were both doing work in Spain. Um, and we kind of made a connection there. And since then, we've been working together through a project in Berlin um, in a garden, in an urban garden. And um, um, what else? I, I kind of like work on these kind of like uh, on, on um, projects uh, outside of the academy um, that often involve like um, long-term sort of processes uh, with, within sort of collaborations. Um, and I'm really interested in, um, yeah, places where we, where we learn um, and sort of thinking about sort of like long-term sort of processes of uh, building up space in common. Um, and um, at the same time, I work in the, the academy and I work in, um, uh, in this department of social practices. And so we focus on critical social practices and it's really about like um, around sort of collaboration and um, uh, uh, sort of critical pedagogy and sort of forms of listening and, and relations and relationality. Um, and so, uh, but there's always sort of like lots of these kind of tensions of negotiations of ways of working together. And so I guess um, that for me has been kind of like this space for um, potential sort of things to learn from. And I hope to like clarify those kind of uh, parts of what I'm trying to explore in this and what, what the next hour together. Um, yeah, Mark. Yeah, so Michelle and I will um, be talking for sometime about this project that we did. We have a structure um, of uh, where we're talking through a variety of uh, three basic questions. Um, uh, and uh, you, I'm assuming you read the project description where uh, we did this um, dream in uh, and conflict resolution project. And we, uh, last time in Berlin, continuing working on it um, in various, um, instances this year as well. Uh, we're going to be uh, speaking, I think, for about 35 minutes, and then we have a very basic question that we'd like to ask you to, um, to think through with us. Um, and the first question that we've given ourselves is, um, where we'll speak for five to 10 minutes is, why uh, we're not experts and where do we come from when we came to this project around conflict and dreaming. The second question that we'll speak for 10 minutes is to describe the project. And the last question, um, before we have a particular prompt that we'd like to discuss and listen to, to from you all, is um, what, we wanted to, what we wanted to learn from the project. Um, yeah. So um, without any further ado. So I'd like to, um, so I, I'd like to start with just showing, um, maybe um, I'm going to just bring up a picture um, for uh, just to have something besides our faces to look at. So here we go. Can you see this picture? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so
So Mark and as I said, Mark and I have been um, working together um, uh, in a in a um, a collective uh, project, and um, actually, sort of within this project, um, there was a, a major conflict, like a major conflict, and. Um, so we were having like these countless meetings and everything was very sort of generative, but it just sort of came to this point where suddenly the positions were extremely fixed. Um, and um, we we got into this this phase where uh, from this moment where we had this creative abundance where all voices were being heard to suddenly there was only one particular way to go forward with the project. Um, and this was like very um, um, extremely painful for a lot of people, and it kind of shattered the process. Um, and um, a lot of a lot of uh, people um, left left the project, um, and it kind of left us kind of talking about that a lot and sort of processing about what had actually happened. Um, so. One, some of the things that were happening where um, there were a, a, a small sort of uh, cohort of people in the group that just really sort of had very much ease of taking up space in the room. You know, so it's, it was really sort of taking up the space from the position of, of privilege, um, uh, being able to sort of make decisions faster, uh, being able to veto or block things that were happening um, and not being able to open to any kind of discussion about a middle ground. Um, the second one was about sort of this aspect of not listening to people's needs um, and just really assuming that everybody was on sort of like the same kind of living situation in the same kind of like state. Um, the third thing was really about sort of like, I would say like this domination of being able to sort of make decisions uh, for others um, and, and not really kind of being sort of open and, and listening to what were the consequences of those decisions. Um, and the last thing I would say was, is really about sort of this, um, um, this kind of situation of being able to say, say, set the narrative and that sort of connected to what we saw as like um, some kind of historical sort of um, legacy um, and sort of ownership of the storyline of the project. Um, so we were just really kind of, you know, wandering and sort of having these kind of things sort of spinning around in his head, um, you know, of a small minority with very, very fixed immobile positions, um, vetoing any kind of decision making process and basically burning people out to the, to the fact they left. Of course, I, I would say that this is quite a common thing that might ha that happens in a lot of group processes, but what we were left with is um, we have a conflict and the conflict creates a blockade and huh, and um, how can we learn from this essentially uh, why why is uh, difference and why is conflict seen as something kind of a negative hindrance in a group process when when it seems to happen all the time and we uh, uh, we the more that we talked with other sort of colleagues and working in other projects, we realized like the similar kind of battles and the similar similar kind of conflicts were emerging. Um, also, sort of related to again, I was seeing like his his story narrative, but also sort of uh, um, money, um, while it, uh, paid and non paid labor, <clears throat> and and also um, things like gender relations. Um, so really that, that's led us on sort of a, a learning journey. And a, we're gonna say once again, that we're not experts and we're really thinking about this project um, um, that we'll get more into detail about, more about, um, yeah, a pedagogical sort of experiments uh, and also thinking about it as a, an artistic work. So we're not sort of coming at you know, this project as, um, therapists or like counselors or professional facilitators, but really um, um, thinking about sort of other ways of of uh, holding space together. In in relationship to the question of um, where we come from when when we began this work, um, I started in two thousand and one 
a journal called the Journal of Aesthetics and Protest that came out of my experience in the 1990s in the ultra globalization movement. Um, I was an artist in Los Angeles coming out of art school um, and um, uh, Cal Arts, which in my little mind was a sexy art school. And um, I was also involved in the 90s in autonomous spaces and reclaim the streets parties and international organizing around um, yeah, the ultra globalization movement. Nobody elected us to start a journal, um, even though I was friends with many movement um, organizers and, um, and was involved in starting a large collective media network, the Independent Media Center. I mentioned this because the magazine at its outset um, reached a very wide audience. And I talk about this because my imagination around what um, a collective possibility um, could be for a movement became very large right away. Um, which, uh, and I also found that um, it was quite, uh, that the Los Angeles art scene and activist scene was quite amenable, it seemed at the time uh, for such a project only because it was the sort of project where you say smart things and then go home at night and people appreciate that, appreciate appreciated that. And we were saying smart and political things and uh, winning friends and influencing people. Um, the conflicts of collectivity that, um, that are, and of just, difference, differences of place, differences of practice, differences of e economics, just seemed to be minor bumps in the road in relationship to our universal preview, uh, purview, our universal look over space and time and dreaming. Um, our own collective conflict, which melded up over time, became interesting subject matter and became stories of gossip in relationship to ongoing professional successes and, um, and ongoing collective research uh, and, and personal narratives. Um, and so, and, and jumping forward now to um, living in Europe and living in Berlin um, and living in Leipzig, um, spending a lot more time encountering difficulties in, in my life and in my practices, but then also being, and also getting deeper into actual or into logistics um, and into eco-social relations and thinking about the ways in which the world is organized and thinking about ethical economies and noticing at the base of life in our cities um, is the fact that we live in highly organized, highly specific um, houses, homes and jobs. Everyone goes at home at night rather than killing one another. And I was quite interested by that fact that at the base of um, the fact that as a theorist and an activist um, at the time, and hopefully as we go forward, we live in a city that allows people to go to sleep at night without, um, without arming themselves. <laughs> And so thinking about uh, our baseline social coherence besides ongoing conflicts. Um, and Michelle and I um, or uh, came up with this dreaming project in relationship to specific conflicts that really blocked, um, blocked the functioning of this one collective group while thinking about the heterogeneous city that works together in conflict, 
um, and, um, and thinking about a history of of having um, uh, having a universe or a more universal abstract relationship to a movement, um, I came up with a metaphor uh, that was very useful for me for thinking about this um, question around dreaming and collective dreaming about life in in the city of um, when we go to bed at night we um, are sleeping with ourselves or a partner. Um, and if the wall between you and your next door neighbor is removed, you're actually sleeping and dreaming with them. And if the walls between all the city were removed at night, we would all be sleeping together. And that became an interesting um, vision for me in relationship to both the abstraction of the global justice movement that I was involved in and also to think about this project. One other thing that I'd like to briefly mention, and it's something that both Michelle and I share as researchers and activists, was our, as she mentioned, our involvement in Spain. Um, it's a social movement called the PA, uh, Platform for People Affected by Housing. And in Barcelona, where I was researching, the coming out of that movement was um, a, social, or a political movement called Barcelona and Comune whose electoral success was based around remapping electoral bodies, not on lines of explicitly around, around traditional neighborhood voters, but needing as an emergent party to rethink the city and rethink the relationships um, in order to develop new forms of power. And one thing that they did that I think is relevant to the idea of dreaming and the and the heterogeneity of working together through difference was that they organized around logistical lines, um, around transportation routes of resources that, that would be brought in and out of the city. And to think about those networks of solidarity that both structured the city peacefully so that it was sustainable, but that although people may have had different bloating, voting blocks in the, in the past, their ability and capacity to labor together to fight despite present and apparent social differences based on solidified political languages, um, where they were able to find some movement in, in that. And so, uh, yeah, when we come to this project, that's something that I think about. Before we move on, do you have anything else to add, Michelle? <clears throat> yeah, so we're so we were like talking about lots of these different things and sharing these experiences, and um, um, and uh, we were thinking about something that we would like to sort of uh, you know try out together as a workshop, um, along with sort of thinking about dreaming and uh, um, and the dreaming um, actually sort of came, I would say, after a fact. Um, because first we were speaking about like um, if we were going to do a workshop where we would think about sort of being in common, um, uh, we I was um, looking at some areas around generative conflict, conflict resolution, listening practices, um, convivial practices. Uh, facilitation techniques and con uh, um, uh, um, uh, mediation, sort of uh, mediation practices of um, Black feminist uh, scholars and practitioners like Adriana, Adriana Marie Brown and Alexis Pauline Gums and August Brown, and, and just really kind of looking through uh, mutual aid practices, uh, um, uh, activists, uh, um, uh, tools uh, built up over sort of years of sort of on the ground sort of work, um, the work of Dean Spade and just really kind of building up our, our kind of, uh, you know, set of sort of practices of critical practices in, in, in order to understand like this conflict. But while we were discussing and said, okay, we have a, a workshop, I, I was also, I was also critiquing this tendency of suddenly stopping this process and saying we have to get to B, right? So we've started A and A was great, but let's get to the, the end point. And I think I was really sort of pushing against um, that there's like this limited time, you know, this kind of formation of the problem, framing the problem, finding the solution mindset, um, which also speaking with colleagues is really falling, out, falling over a, around a project sort of 
time, you know, we started talking about sort of different sort of experiences of time. And one of them uh, is this project time of working within sort of like the limits of funding and working within the limits of, well, it's only, only going to be for one year and we have to sort of uh, do all of these different sort of uh, things together and then report on it, right? And so, and this is um, uh, how it sort of fits within, uh, yeah, uh, group group uh, projects that require some sort of uh, source of funding. And I'm speaking from sort of arts and culture um, so then we realized uh, it couldn't be within a time frame of three minutes, three hours or five hours or whatever. And, and we said, well, what if we have a duration of 24 hours? And so within it, once we realized that there's a 24 hour uh, workshop where we really uh, stretch that time, that part of that time will be asleep. So, so in, a, in addition to these, uh, conversations around uh, how can so we also think about conflict being generative and are there other ways of speaking and other uh, how how do we sort of think about the space between us uh, there was also this aspect of sleep so we all so bringing in all of these kind of notions of time uh, uh, including sort of dream time and world time and yeah we uh, came across uh, you know, this notion of crip time, which is really about sort of discarding notions of productivity and guilt and really like listening to the bodies. So so really sort of pushing back like this uh, very sort of rational and capitalist uh, normative ordering of time of productivity and, and, and trying to sort of hold space in a different way. Um, I was going to talk about the score. Would you like to talk about the score? Sure, I'll talk about the score. Um, so, um, the concept that we had was in a place called the Princessa Garden. Um, we um, wanted to present this project there, and we did in kind of strange ways, but also the, the bulk of our production was supported by um, and in relationship to a place that Michelle showed photos of called um, Floating University. And so, this 24 hours um, that we um, which was also, so coming out of COVID, they were like, ah, we're having so many conflicts and everybody in Berlin is having conflicts in activist groups and, um, and meaningful urban space practice collectives. Um, and so Michelle and I were like, okay, let's develop out of this project, a score for uh, dreaming in com sleeping and dreaming together in common. And so what you're seeing is a slide of the uh, floating university campus, which is um, not a real, oh, it's a speculative university and a beautiful space. I don't, um, and uh, um, so uh, we arrived uh, at 5 p.m. Um, we, introdu we introduced, um, I'll just read the score. Arrival and introduction round with name and pronouns introduced to the schedule, 10 minute partner work. How do we want it to feel in the space between us? Each finds their sleeping spot by what they desire, taking into account the limits of available spaces. Then we had a tour of the chosen sleeping spaces. So everybody had an opportunity to choose how they would be most comfortable and able to sleep. Um, then we saw that. Uh, then organize a meal based on ingredients that each person brought to the common meal. Uh, then after that, a writing experiment around an autonomous eating commune. So uh, everybody was asked to bring a particular object, uh, was asked to bring some food. Um, we didn't specify what just bring food and we're going to make a meal together. So in the way that we all come together as we are, and as we think others are, we kind of said, bring food and we'll cook something. And we called that an autonomous eating commune. Um, short writing, uh, 20, uh, 10 o'clock short writing, describing rules for sleeping together, dreaming and um, living overnight. Do we agree to set up caring rules? What is, the proper angle of the head on the pillow to call in the right kind of dream. How shall we sleep? Reading of selected texts as bedtime stories. 
Now, Michelle organized a whole lot of bedtime stories and we read them collectively. Perhaps you will talk about them when I am done reading the schedule. Uh, 11 o'clock, bedtime dream writing. Each person keeps a journal and pen by their sleep spots to write down dreams as they occur during the night. 8 a.m. in the morning, morning coffee, five minutes of cacophonous talking and listening. Blah, blah, blah. Ooh, a whole lot of that going on. Um, glossolalia, 10 minutes. And then we had a round of um, listening out, uh, where everybody was given five minutes to talk about their dream or their sleep or their thoughts. Um, that was to mirror a talk, talking round that we had the night before. Then 8.30, we established a morning cooking practice based on what it is we wanted to learn overnight. At nine o'clock, we had breakfast, 9.45. Oh, then we had the listening round. Sorry about that. Each person is given a full five minutes to speak or be silent. Group listening prompt will be introduced. 11 o'clock, see if there are plans and working groups established for a day of working. Reading to generate conflict, consensus building, and listening ex exercises will be made available for a short training session. At three o'clock, we had an opportunity for a check-in to see if those working groups had um, moved forward anywhere. Um, and we actually did establish an exercise to be done before the closing time at 16.45, so 4.45, and at five o'clock p.m., 24 hours later, we closed the camp. Um, so this score um, we developed um, after a conversation with uh, some of um, the members of the Floating University Association. Um, and as I've said before, they, they, we were speaking with other people that we know that are involved in, in, converse, in, in organizations who are experiencing similar conflicts. So I've had like several sort of meetings and and um, yeah, basically gossip sessions with um, with um, some members of of the floating university, um, realizing that similar issues were coming up, and they said, "Well, we we'd like you to come in and and develop something with um, members of the organization. Um, who should we invite?" I said, "Well, help invite whoever you would would imagine beside within within the organization." um to um who who you would like to spend the night with so they uh, invited a, a feminist organization um, from warsaw that were stewards of a of a swamp um in 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 the middle of warsaw um and uh um they invited the whole collective to come um and spend the 24 hours with us as well as uh, some members of another network uh, that are sort of engaged in social and, and, and spatial critical um, practices in Berlin. Um, um, so we were all together and there were 25 of us. Um, the score is uh, not really prescriptive, but more as kind of this running, uh, uh, things that sort of running along the entire 24 hours where we are, um, uh, sort of experimenting with different uh, cooking, speaking, uh, listening, uh, different sort of relational practices, and uh, and exploring all of these sort of like ways of um, of uh, of knowing, of speaking, different sort of modes of discursivity, um, and uh, just like kind of let let that score sort of run through there. Um, there were for me some really um, interesting surprises. Um, we uh, brought in um, a, a dialogue of, of, of the conflict that we had experienced and thinking about sort of that conflict of taking it into um, two voices, voice A and voice B, uh, which we had, um, uh, which we retelled um, the conflict by dividing half of the group into voice A, voice B where they became a chorus of voices, you know, retelling um, this conflict of what we termed as an, an exhaustive conversation that went nowhere. Um, and this happened on this long dinner table. Um, it led to a listening round where each person would be sitting around in a circle and be given five minutes to speak or be silent. 
um, about sort of what their sort of connection was or the experiences of, of conflict. And that was sort of part of the uh, bedtime stories of getting ready for bed. Um, the, um, we also had like uh, looking at a number of texts coming from feminist science fiction, um, our dream research, and also uh, one of the first sort of newsletters of the, of the Zapatistas that's speaking about sort of uh, um, uh, dreaming and revolution um, um, and, uh, and resistance, uh, kind of making reference about um, how, um, it, you know, preparing the ground, um, how you sort of, um, resistance is, is uh, before it's highly visible, it's about sort of like how you, you know, prepare the bed, how you prepare the ground before something, you know, comes up. Um, so sort of working with these different sort of metaphors and thinking about like, well, what kind of texts or what kind of stories would we read together and how that might influence, you know, how we might sort of collectively dream together. Um, the second day uh, after we had spent the night um, and each person was, was uh, went around the basin and, and looked for um, the place, um, uh, the invitation was to find a place around the basin. Um, which is where the floating university is located, where you thought you where you where you imagined uh, sleeping in comfort, um, and so first it was uh, finding the spots, and then afterwards uh, describing why they had chosen that space. This was um, actually um, the site of of a contested space, a space that um, was a structure that was no longer there, uh, but that was something that. Uh, uh, created quite a lot of sort of a cons conflictual discussion about whether that space should be built or not. Um, so it's really sleeping right next to the conflict or where conflicts have taken place. Um, the final, the next day after breakfast, we had another listening round. And what I found quite, uh, uh, what I really enjoy sort of like witnessing and experiences, um, the listening round became more of an less um, either or uh, you choose to be silent or you choose to speak a binary sort of choice towards uh, the five minutes. Um, each person has the five minutes uh, to use in whichever the way they want. Um, so we started to have like a lot of embodied um, practices, meditations, uh, listening, intervention, uh, massage, uh, lots of things that have took place within the five minutes um, and, and, uh, and, and some um, responses that it's, I, I know that in this space, my, my silence or my five minutes will not be sort of interrupted because it's my five minutes. And, and I guess it's a question for me about what is, what is silence and, and um, if you have a pause, you know, uh, how often does that sort of pause and that sort of rest uh, be sort of intervened, you know, by more sort of by taking over that space, right? So it's like, I guess the question is like, how often are you allowed to be silent, you know, or or not fill the space immediately with something? So um, these by these kind of practices, it was such a learning experience about, uh, well, that's quite interesting, you know, sort of like how how do you set up these practices? So um, you know, you, you uh, maybe kind of yeah, hold space in a different way. There were several things I wanted to learn through this project. And there were several things that um, I came to, uh, to deepen um, through the project. Um, I was very interested, well, there are two elements. They were quite interesting for me. I um, I was interested in in collective dreaming. Um, I was curious of I was and cu uh, curious both quite concretely in terms of like is it possible that we actually dream together at night? Uh, reading anthropological literature beforehand, reading a fair amount of um, interesting accounts of ways in which societies. Um, economies and socialities were governed, have been governed by dream interpreters um, and ways in which um, that allows for different forms of social relations. And so I did a fair amount of, um, yeah, I did a lot of dream journaling beforehand and I was um, 
Yeah, and that was interesting. Um, I, I noticed obviously that my focus on conflicts was getting deeper. Um, and so uh, I'm not, yeah. And so that was interesting to learn more about how I dream. Um, and it was interesting to spend a fair amount of time thinking about ways in which collective dreaming may or may not be appearing within my dreams. Um, I was surprised about the extent to which uh, those that attended were rather resistant to, um, to the more surrealistic and psych psychedelic possibilities within our collective being together. One thing, and the second thing that um, uh, I was the only um, cis appearing male in the group. Um, and so I was quite, um, that was like a challenge for me. Not that it usually is because I'm often it's not an uncommon situation, but as a facilitator, I felt it was, especially because one of the conflicts, the only, we were not told about the conflict in advance, but I was like, but it was clear that there was some gender-based conflict when the only people who were invited to attend, besides myself, were, um, were um, female appearing, uh, performing people. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I, I was tasked in advance um, to think through that. Uh, and, and so I spent a fair amount of time researching ways of, uh, of performing through that difference. And to be honest, I wasn't surprised by the fact that um, as things got going, I didn't really, I mean, I made a, I made a point of sleeping in a quite public place so that the bear was uh, was placed in a in a place where people knew the bear would be sleeping. But besides, once that moment was passed, I just kind of passed, and so that became something that I yeah, so that was my experience with that one thing. Um, yeah. So, so I've been thinking about, um, there's some, um, well, I'm going to read two, one, one thing um, from, two sort of passages from this glossary. Um, so we have, I've been showing, we're showing like this image of this um, small publication and there's a publication that we made um, for the workshop, which included the score and the introduction. But as we were sort of, talking and, and thinking about sort of how this uh, how this experiment was coming together um uh, we we started to assemble a glossary of a way of sort of like um anchoring or sort of orienting ourselves um of um, um yeah just some some kind of areas um um that seem to be sort of like the anchors of of this practice um so uh, as I as I mentioned, there's a, there's a whole area that's really um, focusing on different sort of notions of time, um, but there's also um, things around difference and dissensus, and I think dissensus um, is uh, something that um, I'm really thinking about um, re related to conflict, um, which is um, that there's really sort of more one more than one way to handle events, you know. So not consensus, but dissensus. Um, um, not sort of trying to uh, reach uh, the immediately sort of social mythology of the status quo, but uh, thinking about sort of complexity and contradictions and ambiguities. Um, the other one is is really connected to this dissensus, which, which is one of like ethical attunement, and that's something from from Bergman and Montgomery, uh, which is about the collective process of experimentation um, and the willingness to experiment and make mistakes and and let others make mistakes as well, um, based on emergent trust, deep listening and attunement and the capacity and the abundance of the collective. Um, but this notion of conflict and contested spaces keeps coming up, you know, so I think this this uh, uh, this this that um to to give sort of like another uh uh another site and another sort of site of the conflict of a conflictual space uh, we're speaking about sort of group 
processes of self-organize or, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, or um, uh, community sort of engage work or sort of uh, 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 movement, uh, you know, projects and movement. Um, and these are sort of happening outside of like these institutional spaces, you know, this, uh, um, I, I, introduced, I started this session describing that I'm working as an um, educator within, within an art academy. Um, and this is like a highly <laughs> volatile and contestable space. Um, and I just have um, a nice conversation with a student um, uh, studying at the academy. Um, and they are part, they have a, a student collective called the Spin Collective, which is sort of focusing on, um, um, uh, you know, um, climate, climate justice issues. Um, and they have developed a number of projects. And one of them is uh, to, to work on a rooftop garden where they're organizing a lot of like self, self organized events where they um, are structuring um, their public, their um, uh, public events. Um, around sort of the pagan ritual, so around sort of winter solstice, equinox, summer solstice, et cetera, uh, and where they uh, focus on topics related to the seasons, um, speak, uh, focusing on uh, composting. Um, uh, also, um, she's very much into, into dream research um, um, and has done a lot of her own kind of uh, forays and kind of uh, we've talked talk a lot about what we found and what we read. Um, and um, and so they're very much interested in, in community building, um, uh, organizing events, uh, st inviting students in to give performances and readings. Um, and it's a it, that's it's coming in clashes with the agenda of the institution, which really interested in more sort of green capitalism and circular economy and uh, uh, and. Uh, and trying to sort of structure that into a fixed uh, curricula that's related to um, still, um, um, yeah, sort of entrepreneurial, sort of business-minded uh, ways of thinking about that that space. Um, and for th uh, hearing her speak about that and how you have these co clashing of agendas and really uh, these kind of battlegrounds of uh, all of these different sort of forces that come together. Um, is something that I really relate to in this uh, urban garden um, and also uh, within this this basin, you know, so there's there's all always these sort of antagonistic forces and, and agendas both within within the within the organization and also all of these kind of um, uh, elements that are um, at play uh, of the discussion between uh, you know, how are, uh, what are the ideals and aims of the use of the space, commodified, non-commodified, you know, forms of collectivity, uh, basically uh, co conversations, of, uh, uh, questions about how do you want, how do you want it to be in the space between us, you know, so how do you sort of think about those kind of uh, social relations. Um, so, so, so we, we were, we wanted, so to I, open up, we wanted to open this up to yeah. um, to uh, to you all, um, and but I just want I just want to say that we were planning to have a twenty four hour sleepover on the rooftop garden um, to to sleep on that conflict. So that's what I how I wanted to end that. Uh, we wanted to open this up to you all to get a sense of um, what what is the somatic um, and affective nature of of conflicts how do you what it is what it, when conflicts are coming at you and and or you're embedded within conflicts and you're hearing and feeling through them how do you, how do you describe um, those feelings um, and or what do they look like how do you sit with them um, yeah the I would like to stop sharing that, but I can't scroll over the stop share. So, because I would like to stop. Is there a way maybe you can stop it for me, Dan? Or is it just me? I'm checking. Uh, uh, I think I can share mine and it'll automatically force you to stop. Yeah, because I can't scroll over the. And I can share. stop mine. Yeah. Okay.
So again, I guess we were curious to hear from you what what where in your body um, conflicts sit um, and how you find yeah just I'm I'm we're interested in the what what the texture of conflict means um, in the abstract um, when you remove the words from the conflict um, but actually experience the feelings um, of those conflicts. I'm just not sure. Um, each conflict is different. I find that depends what it triggers, which conflict from the past it triggers. And that's what causes my reaction. What kind of reactions, if I could ask, do you, do you have? How do, where, where does that- Fear, it's usually fear. Um, I find because I, it's interesting, I've been actually trying to trace, there's been a lot of conflict in communities I've been in in the past couple of years. And it's usually goes back to like when I'm three and my parents were like gonna break up, they broke up and the, my whole world, if it triggers me and if it doesn't like with a lot of the conflicts around COVID and the different ideas, it hasn't been triggering me, but I see it triggering a lot of other people. So that's what I mean. Sometimes conflict doesn't trigger me until it does. Then something happened and it triggered me. But again, it's it's about losing, you know, a parent or something. Childhood trauma every time for me. So fear, yeah. Loneliness, uh, isolation, being not part of the family. Um, um, like basically survival, right? Andrea's written my current conflict chest is my current conflict chest breathing grittiness like sand. Or my effective response, especially in work settings, is to go very still and blank faced. And I suppose that's a freeze reaction that's largely defensive, uh, comes out of fear that any other response might get me into trouble. Um, I'm wondering in the room, um, has, uh, has uh, anybody um, been involved in a sort of conflict resolution process uh, within your organizations or whichever sort of work or social relations you're in or political? <laughs> or any practices that you've come across? I would say we, we haven't been in particular or, or that I can think of right now, but as you were speaking, one area where I thought we could really usefully put some of this into practice at my institution is in a, a sort of background conflict that we've had between our faculty and our staff since over the past couple of years since the faculty went on strike and, and got a raise and stuff as a result of that. And it created a lot of hard feelings for our staff members because they, they didn't, you know, they didn't get the benefits of that for one thing, but it was a very stressful kind of fractious thing for the whole institution. And I, I, think, I think those injuries have not yet been healed and that some of those techniques of just being able to spend that time together, have that five minutes that, that could be very healing for us. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for sharing that. I, I'm interested in, um, in the description of conflict as freezing and, um, and then as, um, as uh, you were saying, Arwen, around injury, and obviously we're talking about um, I'm assuming um, emotional injuries, and so um, and is uh, just to be uh, yeah, just to, if I could ask you a question, do you do you think that those injuries are related to things around freezing? Are they grittiness and sand? Like, what kind of words would you? How would you describe those those injuries? If it's not too much, the, the injuries, like I said, I I'm worried about getting into trouble. 
Um, I don't know. I don't think that's rational, really. I, I don't think it's like I'm afraid, oh, if I say something angry, I'm going to get fired necessarily. I think it's um I think it's a much more immediate personality kind of training thing. But if if I do have some sort of concrete fear of, of say retaliation in, in my situation as an adjunct professor, I think it probably is job security and uh, not necessarily that I would, you know, be fired on the spot, but that it it would be a mark against me in terms of say ever getting tenure, which is highly competitive anyway. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Actually, I did have a conflict resolution. Sorry, I'm not sure how to um, thing a long time ago, and it was basically a healing circle. Everybody got to speak without interruption, and it, and it did alleviate a lot of the. And my um, the physical feeling is the vibration in my fingers. I get a yeah. uh, an electricity. Was that a good feeling or a bad feeling? Or the healing was good, but the the um, um, conflict gives me a buzzing in my. But it didn't. I didn't really say it's good or bad. But I do notice that it comes before um, I have like a meltdown or something. Like I have, yeah, freak out. So now I know, like, oh, my fingers are vibrating. I should probably leave the room or take a day off or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reason why I'm asking about the feelings is uh, maybe it's self-evident, but like can, the way in which we attach works those feelings and the, and the connection between thought, meaning, and embodied stuff. And um, yeah, thinking about how transformation happens in relationship to either shifting the feeling or shif shifting the meaning or diminishing the feeling <laughs> and so um wanting to um after spitting this project at you that michelle and i introduced curious about um yeah hear, hearing a little of the somatics of of conflict in my experience i'm a social worker who's done trauma trauma counseling so i'm you know on a certain way um it's it is an inner child or part that needs to be heard so a lot of people don't like that kind of language um so but doing the circle and giving everybody space it is the probably the inner child or part the younger self that comes up anyway and that could be a way of doing it without calling it like trauma therapy or inner child work or, you know, putting people off. <laughs> What's that? Uh, thanks. Uh, very interesting, I think. Um, no, I was just thinking I work. Um, uh, at the sociology department with drama and with conflict resolution, but I was thinking about the importance of place and the space itself, because I think within the university, there's so much, there's so much aggression, there's so much in the walls in a way. So I was interested to, because I also like to work outdoors, but, and also, also like to work 24 hours, but there's such a difference, but you can't really, it's such a limited, the space itself is so limiting because it doesn't allow that the, the feelings are, are too fine tuned to, uh, they get <laughs> erased as soon as you walk into that, them walls of the uni. And so it's so different. So it was really interesting to hear um, about your, uh, I'm really curious. Thank you. There's something about space. So last year, I mean, it's still ongoing. There's an incredible conflict in our academy, incredible conflict. And it's really like, um, yeah, it's 
it, it's really emblematic of being in a in a in a white supremacist uh, you know institution essentially just to be very straight um very paternalistic behavior um power over uh control over the message evocation of values and safety and you know but not sort of critiquing about whose safety and how are those values being co-created if they're you know by whom and you know these questions so it just causes a huge clash uh um with uh, you know all levels of leadership, uh, students and also staff, and so, so I have been talking. It's like what what if everybody spent the night, you know, uh, the dean and the management and the students and the teachers and and uh, spent twenty four hours together, you know, and and what would that kind of shift something, right? Mm. So so we actually really do want to do that. We do want to spend the night. We do want to sleep in, in the institution, like sleep in the troubles, you know? Mm. Uh, and so it's a, it's a challenge. We don't know if we'll, we'll manage, but it's it's a, something we really like to do. One thing that's interesting for me in relationship to this point is that um, I don't work in a university in the traditional sense, and uh, the conflicts that, um, because of the conflicts that, um, and also the conflicts that, that Michelle and I come from that generated this project are non-institutional spaces. Um, and so it's interesting spatially and socially to think about how, and also the conflicts that I brought to this beside, like the more uh, less vocalized conflicts are things that are much more social and interpersonal. Um, and so to give that an equal space to on the job conflicts, it's interesting that in non-institution non and, non and interpersonal conflicts and like heartfelt differences between people, um, the way in which the non-institutionalized conflict um, has a space and a time frame that is radically different than the institutional and it has allowed for less um less at stake <laughs> although also i think i wonder we michelle and i haven't talked about this a little more wild uh and i'm I get the, yeah, it's hard to say it, the differences in the nature of how Michelle and I hold conflict differently in our in ourselves is something that would be interesting to talk to about Michelle. Yeah, uh, but I would also like to say that I think when it's listing all of these notions of time, I mean, institutional time is something that's not in this <laughs> in this thing, but it's very uh, think about what can you do in the institution related to what your, your comment also. Um, yeah, even it's radical to think about 24 hours, you know, in the institution because it's just uh, institutional space is not set up like that. It's 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 heavily sort of fragmented and it's compartmentalized and it's just like do, 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 just getting you on sort of the, the train towards graduation. So there's so, so small space for reflection and yeah, um, these kind of ambiguities and non sort of non-productive time modes that are really sort of necessary for uh in for uh, for learning and so the institutional spaces are really the antithesis of learning and uh, i don't know it's like this impossibility of having all of these brilliant colleagues saying okay we're trying to sort of you know trying to disrupt it a little bit but there's the whole mechanisms of the institution is completely against these ways of working So that's the battle. Yeah. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> thank, um, you. thank you for so much for listening. That was great. Thing. I love crypt time, by the way. I'm on crypt time. I, I didn't have a word for it. I've been trying to train everyone around me. It's not easy. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.